All right. You know, several years ago, we saw Hurricane Ike hit the Gulf Coast. It was a really powerful hurricane. And the front page of a Texas newspaper and CNN wrote, certain death to those who don't vacate. Now, you wouldn't say the writers of that article were mean for issuing that statement. No, you'd be grateful for the warning. The same way, God's given us a clear warning. There really is a hell. And it's far worse than you can imagine. Jesus talked about it in 46 different verses because that's what he saved us from. So you're going to hear about how horrible it is, but you're going to see that it's your own words that send you there. I'm going to show you that. It's not God sending anybody there. He's trying to keep people out. And, um, you know, but it's far worse than you can imagine. But the other good news is not one person has to go there. Nobody online listening, no one has to go there. It's your decision. God loves you, and he gives us a free will to choose. That's right. On November 23rd, 1998, God gave me an experience that changed my life. This was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that's classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. So in a vision, you can actually travel, like Paul and John actually went to heaven in their spirit bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 talks about a natural body and a spirit body. And uh, in Ezekiel chapter 8, he was picked up by his hair and carried from Babylon to Jerusalem. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept. He conversed. My point is, in a vision, you can experience the same things that you would in your physical body, and it's just as real. Not to compare my experience with any of the great men of the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a scriptural basis of how this can occur for a Christian. I was a Christian for 28 years when this occurred. The only way a Christian can see hell is in a dream or a vision. Job 7.14 says, you scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. So you can have a terrifying vision. Isaiah 21.2, he was given a grievous vision. And in uh, Job 4.14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. Now you might say, Bill, why do I need to hear about hell? I'm a Christian. I'm not going there. Three quick reasons. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what you were saved from. See, a lot of Christians today believe in a teaching called universalism or annihilationism. And that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these shall go into everlasting life and these shall go into everlasting punishment. The word everlasting is the word ionios. So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. You'll thank God you were saved from this horrible place. Number two, it will cause you as a Christian to walk more in the fear of the Lord. You won't want to live compromised and play around with sin. You know, Jesus said in Mark 9, 47, if your eye offends thee, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than in a hell fire. So it will cause you to walk the straight walk. You know, Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So when you understand how severe hell is, man, you'll think, I do not want to go there. I'm going to walk straight and circumspect and holy before God. So that's what I'll do. What is the fear of the Lord? Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 17 said the fear of the Lord is to read his word daily and to obey his word daily. That we have enough respect for Almighty God that we'll obey him. See, when, that's what you have to do. When you fear the Lord, you obey him. And number three, it gives us all as Christians more of a passion for the lost. A desire to want to witness. See, but most Christians come to church and that's great, but they hardly, Bill Bright said only 2% of Christians even bother to witness. 2%. Yet that's what we're all called to do. But see, when you see how severe hell is, you'll think, man, I didn't know it was that bad. I cannot let my family go there or my friends. See, now you'll get up each day and you'll say, Lord, use me. Put me in front of somebody today that I can be an influence to. You'll pray more diligently when you understand how severe hell is. See, you'll pray. You'll get on your knees. Maybe you'll pray and fast for family members. You'll cry out to God and say, Lord, send labors across their path. Father, touch their hearts. Open their eyes to the truth. They cannot go there. I will not let my family go to hell. That's what it'll put in your heart when you see how severe hell is. Because this place is worse than you can imagine, and it's forever. They'll never get out. But see, as Christians, we can pray. We can pray for them so they won't have to go, especially your family. You can claim thy whole household shall be saved. My family is not going to hell. They're going to serve God. That's right. 
That's what it'll put in your heart. I want to just take about five minutes and show you just a short film of what it would be like for a Christian who didn't share their faith. Let's watch that. What if? What if you had a friend who died without knowing Jesus as their personal savior? What if he or she went to hell? What if one day you received a letter in the mail from beyond? A letter from hell. A letter from your friend in the flames of eternal torment. The following is a dramatic presentation. It was written by a fictitious high school student named Josh to a friend named Zach. Although Zach had every opportunity to tell Josh about Jesus, he didn't. They were best friends. They played soccer together, they went to classes together, they partied together, they shared their lives with each other. But there was one thing Zach held back from Josh, his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The rest of the story is simple and sad. A few too many beers, a tragic drive home, a crash, a death, a funeral, a letter. Here is that letter in its entirety. A letter from hell. Dear Zach, I died today. It's a lot different than I expected. You see, I always thought dying would bring me into a world that's foggy and hazy. But this place is crystal clear. It's even more real than my life on Earth. I can think. I can talk. I can even feel. Right after the wreck, I could feel my spirit leaving my body. It was the weirdest thing, Zach. I thought I heard you screaming out to me, man. I must have been just imagining things. At first, I was just standing in line. Getting registered, I guess. They asked me for my name and began to look in this thing they called the Book of Life. I guess they couldn't find it though because this huge angel standing next to me grabbed me by the arm and started dragging me away. I was terrified. I had no idea what was going on. I asked the angel where he was taking me, but he didn't answer. So I asked him again. Finally, he told me that only those whose names were written in the book of life could enter into heaven. And the rest would be contemned to hell forever. And I was scared. The angel threw me into some kind of holding cell where I've been sitting and thinking for a long, long time. Do you want to know what I've been thinking about? I've been thinking about you. Zach, you're a Christian. You told me so yourself. I mean, we talked about it three different times today. Kelly brought it up, and you laughed it off. Coach Adams brought it up, and you changed the subject. I mean, it came up right before the wreck. Well, the question I can't get out of my mind is this, Zach. Why haven't you ever told me about how to become a Christian? I mean, you say you're my friend, but if you really were, you would have told me about this Jesus and told me how to escape this terrible place that I'm headed for. I can feel my heart pounding in my chest. The angels who have been chosen to cast me into hell are coming down the hallway. I can hear their footsteps. I've heard of this hell, Zach. They call it the lake of fire. I can't stand it, Zach. I'm terrified. No, the angels are at the door. Oh no, no! They're coming in and they're pointing at me. They're grabbing me and carrying me out of the room. I can already smell the burning sulfur and brimstone. I can see the edge of the cliff where hell burns. This is it, I am without hope. We're coming closer, closer, closer. My heart is bursting with fear. They're holding me over the flame. I'm down forever. This is it. They have thrown me in. 
fire! Pain! Now! Why is that? Why didn't you ever tell me about Jesus? Signed, your friend, Josh. Your friend, Josh. P.S. Welcome. Wish you were here. Wish you were here. Wish you were here. Wish you were here. Now this is not made to condemn, to condemn us but to convict our hearts. You know, God's entrusted us with the gospel. That's a precious privilege he's given us. He's entrusted us with his words, and we can say something that would change someone's eternity. What an honor. But yet so many don't. All of us are called to preach the gospel, not just the pastors. We're all equipped, and we all have a, an ability, and we have a sphere of influence that we can reach our friends, family, and other people that others can't. I just encourage you to do all you can to win souls because they'll be in this place forever. And God holds us accountable if we don't. You know, Ezekiel 33, 8 says, If we fail to speak to warn the sinner from his way, his blood will I require at your hand. So for the ones that God tells you to go witness to, and you say, Well, you know, I'm kind of busy right now. I'll go later. And you miss that opportunity, God holds you accountable for those. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, Paul said, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So when you understand the terror of the Lord, hell and judgment, you'll be more persuasive with men. You will take more effort. And that's my purpose today. My wife and I went to a prayer meeting that we attended every Sunday night. Nothing unusual about the night. Um, I had never studied the topic, topic of hell at that point. I had never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs. And I never had a vision before. We came home like any other normal night. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. I was walking to our kitchen. And right in about the living room, something grabbed me and pulled me out of my body, like being drawn up out of your body. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel. And I was getting hotter and hotter. And I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. I was fully awake and cognizant, just like I'm standing here now. I had no idea how I got there or why I was there. A filthy, stinking, smoke-filled, but like a dungeon. But see, Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16 says, they shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, the earth with her bars was about me forever. And the Tyndale, the New International, many other commentaries point out that Jonah was at the gates of hell and that it was literal bars and gates. Well, that's why I first found myself. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat it was so far beyond the ability to sustain life. I wondered, how could it be alive in this place? And uh, I, w I wanted to get up and run. That was my first reaction. But I noticed I had no physical strength in my body. It took so much effort to move. But see, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Now, if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, a thousand times worse. Any movement takes tremendous effort. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. Movement isn't automatic. It's from God. I looked up in this cell and I saw these two enormous beasts, creatures, pacing like a vicious caged animal. And these particular two are about 12 or 13 feet tall. It's not an exaggeration. I could give you scripture for that too, but I got to keep moving. And um, they were reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, uh, huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long. And um, they were uh, pacing like the most vicious animal. And the one of them picked me up like I weighed the weight of a, like this bottle, threw me into the wall of this prison cell. 
I hit the wall. I felt as if every bone in my body had broken. Now, a spirit maybe doesn't have bones, but it felt that way. I collapsed on the floor wondering, how could it be alive through this? But I have to explain one thing. I understood that I did not feel most of the pain. I had the understanding that it was being blocked. And I didn't understand, but on the way back, the Lord explained to me that he blocked most of the pain, but he did allow me to feel a small amount of it so I could relate to people. It's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. But the amount I felt was enough. The other demon grabbed me, picked me up, and dug its claws into my chest and just tore the flesh open. Again, how, how could I be alive through this? I should be dead. I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, the rich man Jesus talked about in hell. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak. He had eyes to lip. He had a tongue. So you have some kind of a body in hell, but it withstands these torments. But something else I noticed, there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. It was just all dry. But see, Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They hate you. And, but see, Psalms 103, 17 says, the mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell, so you don't derive that benefit. And um, about this time, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see to describe to people what it looks like. But then he withdrew his light, and hell resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. But Lamentations 3, 6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. But it wasn't just dark. You could actually feel it. And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. Uh, it's so wicked and evil that the darkness just seems to penetrate through every cell in your body. I was taken out of this prison cell, and I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was about a mile across like a huge hole in the ground, about a mile across, deep hole. I, I don't know how I knew it was a mile. I just understood that it was. I can't explain that. But there, this was filled with fire, flames raging high up into this open cavern. And, uh, you know, so it's not metaphorical fire like some say. It's real, literal flames. I felt the heat. I saw the fire. But more importantly, it's what the Scripture says. Psalms 11.6 says, Upon the wicked he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Psalms 140 verse 10, Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13.49, The angels shall sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Isaiah 33.12 says, The people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Many more verses about fire. But this is where I could first see people. I could see through the flames. And it's the most awful sight to see a person on fire. Most of us have never seen that. But to see someone burning. Now, I could not distinguish a man from a woman. They just look like skeletons. And it appeared to me like flesh hanging off their bones. I, it was the most horrible sight. And the screams coming from the people was so loud and deafening. You want to get away from the screams, but you can't. But Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of mind of any kind. But see, Isaiah 32, 18 says, My people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not God's people. She don't ever get to enjoy quiet. You hear, you hear these horrible screams forever. Uh, I understood I was down deep in the earth. I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. Uh, but I understood that's where I was at. But more importantly, there's 49 scriptures that point out where the current hell or Hades is. I'll just give you two addresses. Ezekiel 26, 20, number 16, 32, and 33. Very clear it's down deep in the earth. I also understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. That infers a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That infers a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, of how much worse of a punishment 
Suppose it shall be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Any level is far worse than your mind can even conceive. I wanted to uh, let my wife know where I was at. I just wanted to say goodbye. But I understood I'll never get that opportunity. See, Job 7.9 says, He that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. Sheol, Sheol is the Hebrew word for the current hell. Hades is a Greek word. But I had that understanding I'll never get out. And see, you don't know what that, well, you can't imagine what that's like to have no finality with your family. That you can't say goodbye. You, you can never tell them where you're at. See, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You cease to, you still exist down deep in the earth. And to never see her again, to not let her know where I'm at and say goodbye, that thought alone was really tormenting to endure that you have to endure for all eternity. I mean, you'll never see any of your family. You'll never hug your kids again. Nothing. That's gone. Thing of the past. I wanted to talk to a person, just anybody, because there's pleasure, right, in being with people. Even if you don't know them, it's pleasure to be with a person. But see, those people I saw in the pit, they're all kept at a distance. So you have no conversation. You're isolated. You're by yourself in hell for all eternity. You'll never have another conversation with anybody. And you have no purpose, no destiny. It's just a complete useless wasting away. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. You have no identity. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says, Your name is covered in darkness. And you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88.12, Isaiah 26.14, Deuteronomy 32.26. All these point out that you're completely forgotten. You know, that's an awful thing, that, that nobody up on the earth has given you a thought. You know, most people don't realize that most people are down in hell. You know, if you go to a funeral today, no matter what the religion, they usually say, well, they've gone to a better place. But that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 7, many are going to hell and few are going to heaven. The stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting odors, worse than any open sewer, anything you can imagine. But remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. Demons have a disgusting, foul odor to them, uh, death, decay, and also the flesh, people burning. That is a disgusting odor also. And on top of that, you know, the smell of burning sulfur. Now, if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity of the sulfur coming up, it's called sulfur dioxide. And if you breathe it, it will kill you. It's toxic. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the word brimstone is all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. And it's, I mean, it uh, would make you vomit. And, but it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe in hell. You can't take a nice deep breath. You don't get to do that in hell. There's not enough oxygen. So maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this or a fireman. Uh, this is how you breathe in hell. It was like... <coughs> that was as much air as you could get. Well, it's not enough. You have the feeling of suffocation. And that's going on for all eternity. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God's very specific with his word. You need to sleep in hell. You never get to go to sleep. Now, if you've ever stayed up for two nights, like studying for a test or something, just try to stay up and don't go to sleep for two nights. You can't even function after two days. You're a wreck. Well, in hell, you need to sleep also. But you never get to go to sleep. Revelation 14, 10, and 11 says, uh, And they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now that primarily means no rest from the torment, but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 said, The wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the, you know, the sea is always moving. Cannot rest. You can't rest in hell. You never get to go to sleep. So you have that feeling ongoing, and it gets progressively worse every day. But see, Psalms 127 two, uh, says, The Lord gives his beloved sleep. Again, you're not his beloved. You don't get to enjoy that benefit of sleep. 
I was standing next to this big pit of fire. Now, I have to explain, a pit a mile across here on the earth would produce a lot of light, right? A filled with fire, that would produce light. But in hell, it doesn't. It is so dark, it consumes the light. It doesn't let the light escape. But I could just see through the flames and along the edges. And uh, along the edges um, were individual pits of fire, that some people were in their own individual pit. Others were in this big pit. Some were in prison cells. And along, I noticed I was standing beneath a cavern, cavern walls that were ascending up, were like a tunnel going up. And all along the cavern walls were demons, all different sizes and shapes, twisted, deformed, and grotesque, all of them. And some were only two and three feet tall. Some were 12 and 13 feet tall. Uh, there were spiders, demons that looked like spiders, but some of them were three and four feet across. I can't give you scripture for that, but I can give you scripture for demons that look like frogs, Revelation 16, 13, and read Revelation 9. John describes a demon coming out of the bottomless pit, the most bizarre creature. Read about that. There's some really bizarre looking things in hell. Horrible. And I noticed, though, I was standing on a bed of maggots, solid maggots crawling all over everything and everybody. But remember, Jesus said, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. And he used the word maggot. And I never knew this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, when they consume the flesh, the maggots die. And that's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not. Because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell, so the maggot feeds sweetly on thee, as Job 24.20 says. Feeds sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? See, Isaiah 14.11 says, where the maggot is spread under thee, and the worm will cover thee. Look it up in the original, it's the word maggot. The fear level that you experience in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. And I'm going to share with you an experience I had so you can relate to understand what you have to endure for all eternity. When I was 17, I used to surf a lot. I was surfing off Cocoa Beach, Florida, and it was about 100 guys out that day. It was a really big day. So in that area, that satellite beach area, uh, it breaks out really far when it's big. So we were about a quarter to a half a mile out. And suddenly the guy next to me got his leg torn off sharks all over the water and blood was everywhere so I got up on my knees on my board to get my legs out of the water and a shark passed by my board I was on a nine foot board back then and the shark was longer than my board turned its head I saw its teeth how big they are I saw the stripes that were tiger sharks if you know anything about sharks a tiger shark is vicious they eat anything and all of us guys were scrambling trying to get to the beach and um, the shark came back and bit my board right in half so now I was swimming in the water with my buddy. He was knocked off his board. And he says, Bill, I guess we're dead. I mean, sharks were everywhere. And then the shark came back and grabbed my leg and pulled me down under the water. Now, you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment, right? Even if you haven't been through it, you kind of can relate to what that would be like. I, it's not much more fearful than that. I'm telling you, you, you're so helpless against these huge sharks. Well, that fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. Wouldn't even rate in hell. See, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. You're consumed with this terror for all eternity. It doesn't go away in a few seconds. But you know, a miracle happened that day. The shark not only opened his mouth and let me go, but I expected my leg to be shredded, right? When they grab your leg, that's it. I didn't have one mark in my leg. God was looking out for me then. Amen. And you know, I wasn't even a Christian then. But I got saved immediately after that. So <laughs> I did. And I've been walking with the Lord ever since. And God has been so good to me. All these years, 51 years, so praise the Lord. Amen. Man. I want to take about three minutes and give you scripture about being tormented in hell, okay? Uh, can you bear with me for three minutes? Because some people think, Bill, come on, that's your idea of hell. You're exaggerating it. No, this is the Bible's idea of hell, not mine, okay? So hang in there with me. Matthew 18, 34 mentions being delivered to the tormentors. Luke 12, 47 says you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with who? Who's doing the beating? Psalms 50, verse 22, you that forget God, you'll be torn in pieces. 
Matthew 24, 51, I will cut him in pieces and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Psalms 116, 3, the pains of Sheol have gotten hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Amos 5, 18 and 19, for what good is the day of the Lord to you, judgment day? It'll be darkness. And as a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Job 33, 22, his soul draws near to the pit and his life to the destroyers. Psalms 141, 7, their bones are scattered at Sheol's mouth. Psalms 49, 14, their beauty shall consume away in Sheol from their dwelling. Psalms 32, 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Psalm 78, 49, I will cast my wrath upon them by sending evil angels among them. Deuteronomy 32, 22, for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn into the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with poison of serpents of the dust. Matthew 22, 13, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, John 15, 6, if a man abides not in me, just as men gather branches that are withered, they are thrown into the fire and are burned. Luke 12, 4 and 5, don't fear him who is able to kill the body and no more he can do. Rather, fear him who is able after he has killed the body has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Matthew 25, 41, uh, uh, cast him into outer dark. Uh, uh, Matthew 25, 41 says, um, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And Matthew 13, 40, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the uh, end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall uh, gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke 16, 23, Jesus talked about the rich man in hell. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He was tormented in the flame. And Matthew 23, 33, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? And one more verse, Psalm 74, 20 says, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Full of the habitations of cruelty. The word cruelty there, look it up in the Strong's Concordance, number 2555. It's the word Hamas. You know the terrorist group we've heard, Hamas? The word Hamas means ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. So for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. Well, that's what you're experiencing in hell. So you say, Bill, why would God make such a horrible place? Well, he said why in Matthew 25, 41. Jesus said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go there. It was prepared for the devil. But notice he used the word prepared. That's the same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven. So he prepared heaven for us, hell for the devil. But what he did in the preparation was, see, James 1, 17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. The fresh air, sunshine, fellowship, drinking, eating, sleeping, all the good we enjoy, all comes from God. It's not automatic. So what he did in the preparation was, he withdrew his goodness or his attributes. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1, 5 said, God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said, God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said, God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says, the mercy of the Lord's in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said, it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11, 11 says, water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says, he is the prince of peace. So you see, if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't have the good without God. You can't separate the two. Can you see that? Other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. All through the scripture, it says he will pour out his wrath on sin in the form of fire. But God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. Your choice. You know, we get to enjoy God's goodness here. Psalms 33, 5 says the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. But if you deny him, then you won't get to enjoy his goodness. You know, people look at the mountains, the ocean, the trees, and they say, oh, isn't Mother Nature wonderful? No, that's not Mother Nature. That's Father God that provided all that. Amen? That's right. Yes. As I was looking at all this horror, 
something began lifting me up this tunnel that I was in. And seeing demons and people burning. And I ascended in this pitch black tunnel. And suddenly, this bright light appeared. I knew immediately who it was. There's no question when Jesus shows up who he is. I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a bright, pure, holy light. And like no light I have ever seen. And I just said, Jesus. And he said, I am. When he said I am, I went out. I don't know if I died or passed out, but I was out. But you know, I can only explain that through Revelation 1, 16. John, when he saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. That's what happened to me. But he touched me after a time, and when I came to, when I was at his feet, it hit me so strongly, even though I've been a Christian for 28 years, I thought, if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. I was so grateful for the cross. I was so grateful to Jesus. I just wanted to thank him. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just kept saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But after a time, thoughts started coming in my mind, and he would answer my thoughts. Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. And I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. Now, that statement surprised me. I thought, wait a minute, don't all Christians believe in hell? But we have found out since many Christians believe in, like I said, annihilationism or universalism. That's a teaching that teaches that everybody gets saved no matter what. Everybody goes to heaven. Or soul sleep, you just go to sleep. Many false teachings out there. And he wanted me to point people to the scriptures. I thought, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. Remember John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. See, demons hate God, but they cannot hurt him. But they can hurt his creation. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So all the evil we see in this world, the destruction and sickness and poverty and all that, all that comes from the demonic realm. It's not from God. We serve a good and a loving God that came to give us life. Amen. I said, Lord, why did you pick me? But he never gave me an answer. I think I stumped him. Like, why am I picking this guy? <laughs> no, you know, it doesn't matter. He's given us all something to do. But, you know, this was way out of my comfort zone. I, I was a conservative person. I'm a conservative person. So to be identified with someone that says they've been to hell, you know, I pictured someone on the street corner with a wooden sign and wild hair screaming, repent and, or burn, you know. That's what I envisioned. I thought, Lord, I, I have a real estate career. I have a business. I don't, I don't. Anyway, that's a whole nother. But, you know, God had other ideas. And um, I told him, though, Lord, you know, I feel uncomfortable sharing this. And he said, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. Man, that convicted me. So whatever God's called you to do, I just encourage you, do it with all your heart. Don't back off on it. You know, we only have a short time here. Life is but a vapor, as James 4.14 says. And this passes quickly. So do what God's called you to do. Don't make excuses. I said, Lord, why didn't I know you? I didn't explain to you that God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. Now you say, Bill, where's that in the Bible? In Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holding that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's point out, uh, they were kept by God from recognizing him. God hid it from their minds. Other examples of this are in John 20, 14, Luke 18, 34, Daniel 4, 34, 2 Kings 4, 27, all places where God hid something from their mind, and he hid it from my mind for this reason. You see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't know, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here, because we know as Christians, our destiny is heaven, right? I would have known that. He wanted me to experience what they feel, hopelessness. See, Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. 
And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. And see, none of us in life know what it's like to be hopeless. Because even if your situation is so dire, you're in agony and pain, you know you can die to get out of the pain. But in hell, you understand, you'll never get out. See, we can't wrap our mind around that. We think of time as a beginning and an end. But in hell, you grasp eternity. There is no end. You will never get out. There's no angels to come rescue you. There's no Calvary coming over the hill. You're alone forever. I just want that to sink into you for a minute because that's the worst part of hell. Actually, it, it should make you go insane realizing that you'll never get out. But you never get to go insane because that would be an escape. And remember the rich man, he wasn't insane. He knew his brothers were going to come there and they needed to repent. And he wanted to send back Lazarus to warn his brothers. So you have your mind in hell. I had my full memory. I remembered my wife and my life, that a thing of the past makes you really appreciate life and everything that's wonderful, breathing fresh air and sunshine and taking a shower, all these wonderful things that we get to do. And hell, you never have anything ever again. I said, Lord, those demons look so powerful because they were huge. And he said, all you have to do is cast them out in my name. He said, so matter of fact, like, we have the name of Jesus. And his name is so powerful that those big demons are no match. None. They are powerful and wicked if you don't know the name of Jesus. But with that name, you know, and I have to explain this. This is really strange. But when I was traveling up this tunnel, and, and before Jesus showed up, those demons were huge. And they looked so powerful. But when Jesus showed up, they looked like ants on the wall. I can't explain to you. I don't know if they really shrunk or that's just how they appeared. I believe the Lord wanted me to see how really insignificant they are when we use his name. It's like if you walk and you step on an ant, you wouldn't have given a thought, would you? That's how he wants us to see the demon realm. They're nothing if we walk in holiness, walk with God and use his name. Amen. All right. We kept traveling up this tunnel, and um, we went above the earth, and I looked back at the earth. So this tunnel came out of hell and ascended up through the atmosphere. I, I can't explain. I'll just tell you what I saw. And I looked back at the earth just like an astronaut would see the earth. And it was so beautiful to see the earth from space. I mean, you know, as a child, I wanted to be an astronaut. And I believe the Lord remembered that thought. I mean, he didn't have to take the scenic route home, you know, but he, he let me see the earth. I'm telling you, if you could see it, I don't, I don't know how you could not get saved. And they say most of the astronauts get saved once they see it when they're out in space because you see God's glorious creation hung on nothing. What's holding up the earth? And it's turning so perfectly at a thousand miles an hour, not varying. And the water's not moving. The huge ocean doesn't move every day. It stays. If you try to fill up a bowl of water and walk across the room with it, you'll spill it. And God's got it spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, and the ocean's not even moving because he commanded it to stay still, you know. I'm just sharing with you a few things that I got to enjoy being in his presence for a little bit. And um, I looked out at space. I could grasp more than we can here how big the universe is the endless number of stars, and he's given every one of them a name. Can you imagine? There's, there's no nu amount. Uh, you can't even come up with a number. He's named them all, and every single planet and star is in perfect order. He's running all that, and he knows every thought in all of us at every moment. And he knows every hair on our head at every moment, which changes. <laughs> it's increasing for us guys, you know. Anyway, all these things, I could see how powerful of a God we serve. I mean, he runs everything, and we sometimes wonder, will he answer our prayer? There's nothing too big for God. Nothing. I mean, he'll answer it if we have faith. Amen? Anyway, I was enjoying all that, but then he had me turn around and look at this tunnel, this, like, whirlwind tunnel that we, there's scripture for this too, but uh, that that I, we came up out of, and people were falling one after another, after another, back down that tunnel into hell. And he allowed me to feel peace of his heart, the anguish he feels for a soul going to hell. 
You know, Ephesians 3.19 says his love passes knowledge. You know, we all love our family, our loved ones, our children, and all. But God's love is so far greater than ours. You can't even imagine how much he loves people. And I'm just going to share with you a scripture he opened up to me. In Psalms 139, uh, what is it, 17 and 18, I think it is. David said, your thoughts toward me, Lord, are all precious. And I suppose if I should count them, they're more than the sands. Another verse says more than the sands on the whole earth. So in other words, that, see, if I picked up a handful of sand, there'd be thousands of granules in my hand, right? If each one represented a thought, and I took a grain and I said, I love how my wife prays for me all the time. I love how she prays for her family. I love how beautiful she is. I love how smart she is. You come back three or four hours from now, and I'm still trying to exhaust them out in my hand. You would say, Bill's really gone over his wife, right? He's crazy about her. That's just to exhaust the amount in my hand. And God says his thoughts are precious for all of us more than the sands on the whole earth. How many granules of sands are there? You can't even imagine, right? And that's not an exaggeration because God can't exaggerate. So that's how much he loves every person and doesn't want them to go to hell. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he would have given his life for just one. And he went through that horrible death that he did because he loves us that much. And as I came back, we came back down and I looked at my home and I could see through the roof. I, and I saw my body lying on the floor. I thought, that's not me. This is the real me. The spirit man is the real me. The body looks so temporal. It looked like, just like your car. If you get out of your car, it's not you. It's just a vehicle to get you around in in life. Well, that's how the body looked. Like, that's not me. That just gets me around in life. But this is the real me. And this will last forever. And, uh, and he showed me a puff of smoke went up. And I said, Lord, what's that? He said, that's your life. Life is but a vapor. I said, that's it? It was over like a tea kettle. You know, you see, it's gone. I said, Lord, we don't have much time. He said, yes, but what you do for me during that short time, I will count for all eternity. Wow, that gave me a better overall eternal perspective on what's important in life. I mean, we, we waste time on things that are not important. What we need to think about is heavenly things. Be about the Father's business. Do all we can to win souls and spend time with the Lord. And Yeah. Because, you know, it might seem like long, 100 years that you live, but it's a vapor compared to eternity. And God will remember everything you do. He writes it in the book, and he'll reward you forever in heaven. I mean, come on. Doesn't that motivate you to want to do more for God? You know, life goes by. It, it goes by quick. I mean, it seemed like just not long ago, I was surfing at 17. You know, now I'm almost 69. I'm, what happened in these years, you know? It goes by quick. But, you know, God remembers everything that we do. So just pour out all your heart. Give it all you can for God. Amen? That's right. Use your talent. God's given you something that the other person doesn't have. And, and just say, God, what do you want me to do? I'm available. But all of us can win souls. Every single one. You, you have an influence at your work, your people, you meet, everybody. And, you know, uh, Charles Spurgeon said 90% of our witness is through our life example. It's not just preaching to people. I mean, they watch you. You show up on time for work, even early. Stay late. Do work with excellence. Do more than you're asked. Show forgiveness to people that are ugly to you. Uh, be quick to forgive people. They're watching all that about you. You don't have to say a word. And they see that about you. And I had a friend that did that. And he, he didn't, no way he didn't want to be a Christian. But he came to me one day and he said, Bill, I trust you and I'm going to be leaving. And I, I, I don't even want to trust my family, but I'm giving you the keys to my house, my bank account, everything. Uh, and I want you to, in case anything happens to me, I want you to look over everything for me. And he was a heathen guy, but he watched me over the years. So it was a trust. And so... Anyway, but you can also, we're supposed to use the Word of God also, of course, and share it. But, but be sensitive to the Holy Ghost because we witness different to everybody. You don't preach to everybody the same. And, and just to share you one last quick story, and I'll get into uh, I had a lady that wanted me to list her home, and she was um, 
she, she said, Bill, list my home. I don't want to hear about the Bible. Don't you tell me about the gospel. I'm not interested. She was elderly, probably in her late 80s. And um, she would, now normally you would respect a person. And you say, of course, you don't want to hear it. I'm not going to say anything. You know, we don't push our stuff on anybody. But the Holy Spirit rose up in me and said, no, don't let her go off the hook. You tell her about me. And I thought, Lord, are you sure? And I said, and, and he kept prompting me to say something. And she goes, no, get out of my house. I don't want to hear none of that gospel stuff. I don't believe in any of that. It's fairy tale. And I said, no, you know what? You've been pushy your whole life, and you probably never even heard the gospel. I'm going to have you hear it right now. I don't care whether you give me the listing or not, but you're going to listen. And she goes, get out, get out. And I go, no, you're going to listen. So listen to me. And uh, I just felt that kind of boldness. Now, this is, you normally don't do this, but if Holy Spirit touched Anyway, I told her the whole thing. And... Um, Anyway, she says, get out of my house after anything. I've told her how much God loved her. He wants to take her to heaven. And she was not interested and just says, get out. But at least I told her. I left. Two hours later, she was dead. Now you see why God was telling me. Because he wanted to show her the last opportunity to get through to her so that she has no excuse. I'm sure she heard of God all through her life. But even the last minute, God can show her and say, look, I tried with you right to the last and you wouldn't listen. That's why God prompted me to do that. Anyway, so just be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. That's my point. That's my point. Now you might say, Bill, but you know, I'm a good person. How can a loving God send a good person to hell? Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But you, if you're going to go by the standard of good, then good doesn't work for two reasons. Number one, if you're going to go by that standard of good, then you have to compare yourself with God's standard. And James 2.10 says, if we offend his law in one point, we're guilty of all. If we lie once, if we steal one thing, if we have one uh, lustful thought, Jesus said that's the same as committing adultery, and no adulterer will inherit heaven. Well, that's just three of the Ten Commandments. So if we're going to be judged by that standard of good, would we be guilty or innocent? Everybody's lied or stole or had one lustful thought. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24, 9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If you have one foolish thought, that would exclude you from heaven. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? So you can't stand there before God and say, hey, I'm pretty good. Let me in. He's going to say, no, you're not good, not according to my standard. Matter of fact, Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. Thank God it's not based on being good, but on a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. That's right. But you know, you might not be convinced yet about this goods, because if you're unsaved, you really struggle with this, because you think, my neighbor's good. Hey, he takes care of his family. He's a good person. Well, let me give you an analogy why good doesn't work. I was on a secular radio talk show, and they said, Bill, watch your back with this guy. He does not like Christians. I went on the air, and he says, okay, Christian, don't you quote me one Bible verse over my airwaves. You got that? I don't want to hear none of that Bible on my airwaves. I said, okay. He said, I submit to you that you Christians are unreasonable because you don't consider my viewpoint. My viewpoint is just as valid as yours, and I'm a good person, and I should be let into heaven. And if your God doesn't let me into heaven, he's actually guilty of a hate crime. So what do you got to say for yourself, Christian? Well, what do you say? You're live on the air. Well, God gave me an analogy. Thank God. <laughs> I said, okay, you think you're a good person. You should be let in heaven. He goes, that's right. I said, say you went and found the most expensive home in the country and knocked on their door and said, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? Now, right? You don't know then. You wouldn't expect them to let you move into their house. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as the son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because you're a good person. What does good have to do with it? You don't know him. Right? You have no relationship with him. I said, God offered to be your father throughout your whole life. But you pushed him away. You said, I don't, want, I don't want you in my life. See, God's your creator. He's not your father to invite in Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. Galatians 3.26, John 1.12, John 8.44, Romans 9, 7 and 8, John 17.9, Ephesians 5.1, all explain that he's your creator. He's not your father to invite him in. So it's unreasonable to expect to live in someone's house you don't even know. He says, whoa, you can fight back. That's what he said. He said, well... I submit to you. He says, you know, I think all roads lead to heaven. That's what I think. And I said, okay, you think all roads lead to heaven. And he said, 
So God gave me another analogy. Thank God, again. And I'm in here live on the air, syndicated across America. And I said, okay, say you invited me over to dinner to your home. And you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. But that's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I'm going to go north on 95. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. Well, you're going to tell me, Bill, you're not going to get to my house. I'm trying to give you clear directions to my house. The same way God gives us clear directions to his house. I, I think God knows where he lives, right? All we have to do is follow his clear directions and we will get there. That's not narrow-minded. That's specific. He's given us specific directions on how to get there. He's not trying to keep us out. Amen? Now, this is the clear directions to heaven. John 3.36 says, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You have to know the Son. How do you do that? Just two verses. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, Unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. What does repent mean? That means to agree to turn away from a sinful lifestyle and agree to follow Jesus. See, it's not enough to mentally assent to the fact and say, Yeah, I believe Jesus is God. And just go about your own thing and do your own thing. That's not repentance. It takes a humble heart to admit, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself, and I'm tired of sinning. I want to turn away from sin. I want to follow Jesus. That's what a repent of heart is. That's what it takes to be saved. And number two, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You have to believe in your own heart and confess him with your own mouth. You know, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You want to live at his house? You do it his way. There's only one way. You say, Bill, but I just don't believe that. Well, then I have a verse for you. Revelation 21, 8 says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. There's the warning. He just gave you a warning. If you don't believe Jesus is the only way, he just told you you'll end up in the lake of fire. Now that's why you can see why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you because you said, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe Jesus is the only way. You send yourself to hell. He's trying to keep people out. You know, and to prove he loves you, he gave us all a free will to choose. Love doesn't force anybody. He gives you the free will. He tells you the way to heaven and how to get out of hell. It's very simple. You know, when the Titanic set sail, there were all different walks of life on that ship. All different religions, all different beliefs. And they say there were three classes of people. The lower, the middle, and the upper class. But when the star, when it went down at the Starline office in Liverpool, England, there were two signs posted. And people would wait anxiously each day as a man would come out to write their relative's name down on one of the signs. One sign said, known to be saved. The other said, known to be lost. Now, when the ship left, there were all different walks of life, all different religions, all different beliefs, and three classes of people. But in the end, there's only two. You're either saved or you're lost. You know, Revelation 20:15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God actually has a book, and he's going to look to see if our names are in it. So my question for you tonight is, do you know if your name is written in his book? You have to be certain of this one. Please don't take a chance with your soul. Because whether you know it or not, you will spend your eternity in one place or the other. And heaven is not our default destination. There needs to be a purposeful act on our part. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's anybody in here that would say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book. I'm not certain. But I want to be certain. And I don't know if I've ever really repented. I've been living compromised, and I want to get my life right with God today. I'm tired of playing around with this. If that's you, I'm going to ask you at the count of three to raise your hand. One, two, three. Slip up your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. 
I see your hands. Thank you for your honesty. If you're not certain, you want to raise your hand. Or if you just want to get your life right with God and you've been, you know better, and you, but you've been living compromised and you want to get it straight, today is that day. If everybody would stand to their feet, I'm going to ask each person that raised their hand, I'm going to challenge you to get out of your seat. Come down to the front and give us the privilege of praying for you. I know it takes some guts to get out of your seat, but it shows God you're serious. You're not making a half-hearted decision. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. Most of us have done this. This is a really special time, and you'll never forget this time at the altar. Thank you for your honesty. The wisest decision you could ever make. If there's anybody else, it's going to take about another 30 seconds. You know, one second after you die, it's too late. The opportunity you have is right now. There's even one more person. You know, it says all of heaven celebrates over just one. That's how precious you are to God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. Okay, we're going to say a prayer. And you guys are going to say that, repeat after me, and just, it's going to come from your heart, really. But we'll just say these words and it'll change your whole life. Whether you're recommitting or giving your life afresh we'll say these words and we can all say this out loud are you ready okay first of all I'm going to ask you guys up front just lift your hands up to the Lord just as an act of surrender it's like saying Lord I surrender my life to you I'm giving you my life you gave your life for me I'm giving my life to you okay say dear God in heaven I know that I've sinned and I cannot save myself I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. That he was crucified, died and was buried, but rose again and lives forevermore. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent. I'm sorry. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit. I want more of you, Lord. I want all you have for me. Thank you, Jesus, for taking me to heaven. Thank you for dying for me. And I now confess, I'm a born again Christian and I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, praise the, praise the Lord. Man, yes. Praise God. You guys, this is the wisest decision you could ever make. You might not really realize it all yet, but I just want to share with you two things that's important. Number one, get in the habit of reading the Bible every day. It's not just a religious exercise. The Bible is a manual for life. It's like you read manuals for computers to learn how to use it. Well, the Bible teaches us how to live life and because you want to get to know this Jesus and you get to know him through his word and you'll fall in love with him. There's nobody like him, nobody. Also, Jesus teaches us how to resist the devil because you have an enemy. The devil hates your guts and he wants to destroy your life. But if we learn the word, we can, Jesus, when the devil came, he said, it is written. And then the devil fled. But you got to have the word in your heart to know the quote, it is written. So it's important to get the word in your heart. Number two, it's important to go to a good spirit filled on fire church like this one. Amen. Yes, it makes all the difference in the world where you go.